the Saskatoon Community Foundation exists to connect people with the causes that mean the most to them. We work with donors and their trusted advisors to help find a path in business and estate planning that is enriching and meaningful. So tonight isn't just about legal and tax implications of business succession, though don't worry if that's what's keeping you up at night, Elaine is here to help. Um, but it's about um, using money as a tool to make a statement about what's important to you through giving. And, and it's about so much more, as you'll find. But this is a tool that you can share with your children and grandchildren and teach them how to use. Our first question with a new donor is always, what do you want your gift to do? As you take in what Elaine will share with us this evening, I invite you to ponder that as well. One thing I guess I've learned in 40 or so years uh, in the area of wealth transition is that transferring maximum wealth doesn't guarantee uh, wealth or family harmony in the next generation necessarily. And uh, in fact, there's a lot of research, and many of you have, have heard of this, that roughly 70% of wealth transitions fail. Now, what are the origins of this? And uh, a lot of it basically is it lies within the family itself and they seem to have a way of self-destructing. Uh, you've heard of uh, situations where the family goes from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. So will this wealth help or harm the family? That's a concern that I have, or a lot of our clients have. I have in my family as well, too. Uh, entrepreneurs are some of the community's greatest givers. They're very generous people. Uh, in our community, that's very, very true. So uh, shared family vision brings a sense of harmony within the family. And philanthropy could be a very, very good tool in helping enhance that in, in some fashion. One of the largest underlying cause is the breakdown in communication and trust that happens within the family unit. In fact, 60% of the respondents in most of these research talks about that. 25% say it's inadequately prepared heirs. That only leaves 15% to the rest of the reasons for why this breaks down. And then if some people are thinking, well, it's because of the poor tax planning and it's the poor legal and financial advice that's being obtained, that only accounts for about 3% of the failure from generation to generation. We're very pleased to have tonight here one of Western Canada's, one of Canada's uh, special people in this field. Uh, Elaine Fraze is going to talk about uh, discussing the undiscussables. And uh, it's uh, interesting in her approach, and I'm sure we'll find it very, very entertaining, as well as we're going to walk away with some tools here that we could apply in our own family situations. Elaine is a certified family business transition coach. She specializes in helping families work through the tough issues to take action. Many families have come to her looking for ways to tell the non-business children that they are not getting a raw deal. She creates a safe place for families to meet, plan for change, and be clear about expectations. Uh, Faith Today magazine has dubbed her Canada's farm whisperer. So we've all heard of the horse whisperers. Well, this lady is the, she's the farm whisperer. She recently was awarded the Farm Management of Canada Wilson Laurie Award for Excellence in Farm Business Management and the Most Distinguished 4-H Alumni Award. I know there's somebody here with a 4-H uh, jersey on. Yeah, so she's going to vouch for this as well. Elaine is an award-winning author. She has four books. She's brought one that you're sitting near and she's going to be happy if you take that back, or if you can't use it, you can perhaps give it to somebody who can. Um, she farms with her husband, her son, and her daughter-in-law in southwestern Manitoba in Bois of Aine, which is just south of Brandon. She farms on a certified seed farm. And uh, in 2019, uh, the, it was their 42nd year of crop that they had put in and harvested uh, BMO, Oh, has, has, okay, 42nd in and only 41 harvested. So we're in for, we need some rain, don't we? Yes, I think so. So uh, 
the, the Brandon Winter Fair awarded uh, BMO, named their farm as the family farm of the year. Her latest joy, although, is being a grandma. Uh, being rich in relationships is important to Elaine, and she hopes to speak some courageous conversations for your business, for your business and businesses here tonight. So let's welcome Elaine Fraze. Sparking successful conversations. Uh, you saw the welder there, and sometimes um, we need to go back to our story. I grew up on a farm just east of Winnipeg. The house I grew up in was called the Help House, which was the first farm east of Winnipeg. And I used to sneak into the shop to watch my father weld, and the sparks were flying everywhere. Are sparks a good thing? Yes, they are. Sparks are a very good thing when you're welding. Are sparks a good thing when you start a forest fire? No. So tonight, I really want to give you practical tools as family businesses to empower your family. And you saw those beautiful grandchildren. They just moved in next door to me in April. We had Penny's tea party on Sunday. And so my life now has very much changed where I work in the morning until nap time is over around 3.30. And then I have a grandma path through the shelter belt and I get to go and play with them for three or four hours while their mom comes the other way through the path to the farm to work on accounts and invoicing. So just like you, I'm a business owner, a grandma, a mom, a volunteer, a 4-H'er, and the list goes on and on. The second point here is increasing profit. And Dr. David Cole, who is a friend of mine, a colleague from Virginia Tech at, uh, in university in, down in Virginia, did a study of family businesses, particularly farms over six states, 400 farms, and the ones that would meet regularly and actually talk were 21% more profitable. And those of you in the financial field who uh, care to read The Western Producer, if you saw The Western Producer this week, Saskatchewan is in for a tough summer. Not only have you only had one thirteenth of the rain that Saskatoon usually gets at this time of year, the debt has risen almost as high as 60% and net revenue has dropped. And that's for the agricultural sector, which of course is going to affect and have a ripple effect for everything else, right? So I, I got warmed up today. I was meeting at 2.20 on 20th Street West in a boardroom with five family members in business. And they said, Elaine, we got you warmed up for tonight. And I said, yes, you did. So I want to um, share with you what we learn through the process of having more courageous conversations. And then at the end there is um, the last point of my essential message is, what does it matter? Because I'm not taking it with me. I buried my sister to a drunk driver when she was 23. I buried my mother of an asthma attack in a harvest when she was 65. My mother died six weeks after we met as a family meeting. And it wasn't the family meeting that killed her. It was, <laughs> although that could be a possibility, right, in some families. It was actually um, her asthma. So what does legacy mean to you? And you have our sponsors tonight are the uh, community, Saskatoon Community Foundation and Continuity and I, I really want you to sit with this slide because what legacy are you living? And John Ortberg wrote an amazing book called The Life You've Always Wanted. And Jerry alluded to that. You may know what you want to be more efficient in your tax. You may know what you want for your capital assets to be transferred. But the biggest and hardest part is what do you really want for your family? What legacy and what does legacy mean to you? I am a fifth-generation Canadian farm girl married to a third-generation, um, no, first-generation, Wes is the, f no, let's get this straight again. Okay, let's back up the tape. I'm fifth-generation, I'm a fifth-generation Canadian, let's put it that way. And Mr. Giesbrecht here wanted to know, how can you know this word, Englander? Well, I'm an Englander because I come from an English, Irish, Scottish background, which you'll see later how that evolves. And I'm married to a Mennonite farm boy whose parents came from Russia with $600 way back in 1926. So the farm I live on in our business is matriarchal, not patriarchal. And the legacy that we want for Ian, because Ian is going to be third generation. And according to Jerry's stats, it's really bad, right? And we don't want that to happen to our family, and I don't want that to happen 
to your family. So what, does, what legacy are you living in terms of richness in relationships and richness in terms of how you manage your wealth? And I, I really like the saying here that's on the back banner, the meaning of life is to give meaning to others. So we'll explore this. So some of you have notepads with you. This is being recorded, and it will end up on my YouTube channel, which is at um, youtube.com, which I think you might know of. And it's uh, Farm Family Coach, so that's how you'll find it later. And I think Continuity and probably the Foundation as well will have it posted on their website. So just sit back, relax. Um, I have my phone in my pocket, and I'll check it periodically for um, questions. Oh, welcome. Thank you very much. I know my text is working. Um, and if you like my suit, you can comment it, but that's not why we're here tonight, okay? Because sometimes I get comments on my suits, too. I don't know what that's about. So here are my three C's, and this was very critical in our meeting this morning because at the top of my flip chart, I wrote clarity of expectations. I have a bunch of one-liners. They're called the phrase that pays. It's based on my name. So the one-liner for clarity of expectations is love does not read minds. I have no idea what you people are thinking right now, unless you share this with me. And clarity of expectations is, what do you expect for your life going forward in the new stage? I am 62 and a half years old. And this is important for you to know that, because as a coach, I need to know how old you all are, because guess what? You're not 21 anymore, and I hope you're not hurt by me saying that. All right? Because we age, and we go through different stages. The second C is certainty. Why do we have insurance? We have insurance because if your house or your shop burns, you want to be sure that it's going to be replaced and you can carry on in your business. My husband was in a significant accident in um, October 2nd of 2017, and um, our shop burnt two days before Easter, a few months later. So we, our insurance file didn't look very good that year, but we were very happy to have it. So certainty of timelines and agreements. Can you live on a promise? Can you transfer a piece of land on a handshake in 2019? No, you can't. So we need certainty of agreements. And then the last thing is, you can go to all these wonderful assistants, advisors. There's friends of mine here from the Canadian Association of Farm Advisors, who's a tax specialist. James is here from Conversations Consulting. And James and I haven't seen each other in 15 years, but we were farm debt mediators together. And he still has a practice here in Saskatoon. Rob Newfeld is here. He, our, our children went to Bible school together in Hepburn. Do you see what's happening? We're all one degree of separation uh, apart, but whatever we do as advisors, however we're trying to help our families or our businesses, does it matter if you don't put it into action? The Chinese, again, have a saying, talk does not cook rice. So when Wes walks in the door and is expecting supper to be ready, which is one of his love languages, which is acts of service, if he can smell something cooking, he knows it's a good night. Tonight, he's having peanut butter sandwiches, probably. <laughs> it's just the way it is. I want to encourage you to think about what are the important conversations? What sparks do you need to ignite? And the first one is income stream. So there's another financial planner in the Saskatoon area. His name is Terry Wise. He's also a CAFA member. And he spoke last November. And he said, Elaine, there's three questions that I want families to understand. What are their income streams? Where are they going to live? And how are they going to be fair to their non-business heirs? I said, you're kidding me. I said, those are exactly my three key points. So let's not make this more complicated than it needs to be. So I have the piggy bank here. And my question is, how is your personal wealth bubble doing? Personal wealth bubble is a, a, a term of my friend Merle Good, who is a former tax specialist in Alberta. And if you have a very healthy personal wealth bubble, that gives you a lot of security and certainty to be divesting or transferring gifts with a warm hand to the next generation or being a benefactor while everyone still has a beating heart. And I don't know about you, but I prefer to give with a warm hand and not a cold one because I like to see what my gift is doing while I'm still alive. And so in Wes's family, his mom, as she was dying of cancer, she had great delight listening to Ian and Erica and Alicia and Andrew coming to the end of her bed and saying, Grandma, this is what I plan to do with the money you leave me. 
And it gave her delight to know that her gift was going to have meaning. Another question is, in terms of the money issue, is how much debt do you expect the next generation to carry? And I'm sorry this is a combine picture because I'm a farmer and I speak to farm audiences, but our, our intention tonight is for all family business. So whether your debt is for this $500,000 piece of equipment, which is the price of your house in the Willow Ridge, or is it um, whatever it is, do you have conversations or have you ever talked about are you able to carry this debt or do you even want this debt? So what am I going to do with my 75-year-old who says, Elaine, I'm willing to start planning with you when I get my $2 million debt paid off? When do you think that might happen? <laughs> Never. Or not likely, right? So, so that's why clarity of expectations is my first C. Are your expectations reasonable? And again, what's your number? I'm a farm kid, I grew up on a farm, I became a home economist, I did the right thing, I married a farmer, I'm now birthing, you know, fat farmers, and, and, and it's just been my whole culture. But I, I can sleep with a $600,000 operating line at night, but I have people that I know that can't. So my daughter-in-law came from the city, and she's shopping in co-op in downtown Bois Vane, and she and she calls me mom, and she said, Mom, why do people stop talking to me when I tell them I'm from the city? I said, Kendra, that's just a very interesting question. It's because they're judging you. <laughs> she said, really? Yes, because you're from the city, you don't know anything about farming, so they're judging you and they stop the conversation. I said, but you can change that by your approach, and she certainly has because she's jumped in with both feet. So as I was getting ready for tonight... I asked some of my colleagues, what do you think is the biggest thing that's, that's causing a stumbling block for families in business? And I thought this was a very good answer. Familiarity. Oh, I know what you want for supper. I know what your favorite dessert is. Oh, and I know where you like to go on vacation. And we're family members, and we make assumptions. But back at the beginning of the presentation, there was a slide that said, that was then, and this is now. So when Wes's mother is dying and running out of money, she goes, if I get better from this, will somebody take care of me? Because I've given most of my money away. And we said, Mom, we are not going to leave you on the street. And she said, well, I guess that was then, and this is now. And I attribute this saying to her. So sometimes we make plans and want to have certainty going in a certain direction, but sometimes things change, and then we have to make a course correction. So here's my question for you on your way home tonight. I want you to play the what if game with your spouse. What if you died? Who would you remarry? My financial planner told Wes two weeks ago, Wes, if Elaine dies, I bet you're going to get remarried. But Elaine won't. He was quite horrified by that, actually. <laughs> and he said, most women don't want to get remarried quickly, but the men really usually do. I said, well, somebody, you know, some women have to get married. If the men are getting remarried, how does that work? But uh, <laughs> does not compute. Okay. But again, it's all based on assumption. And so I had this young couple in Langley, B.C., who had come to the seminar on the ferry from Gibson's Landing, beautiful, the Sunshine Coast, the four business owners, and they said, Elaine, on the way home on the ferry, we are going to play the what-if game. And she gave me an empty pad of paper, and she said, in the next five minutes, can you just write down six or ten more what-if questions? It's a very interesting game to play. So what if I die this summer? I'm actually preparing to have my casket built in the next month. Why would I do that? I'm perfectly healthy. But my friend Ed died of prostate cancer in January, and he had a beautiful pine box at the, beginning, at the front of the church, and his grandchildren had painted artwork on the side. It was a beautiful testimony to his values and the kind of person he was, and it was built by a local carpenter who I know who built the stairs in my son's new house. Now this man, this young man, has had an accident and can no longer be a full-fledged carpenter. And I said to him, Sheldon, would you like to start a casket business? He said, yeah, Elaine, I kind of would. I said, well, how much would you like me to deposit? He said, you're in? I said, I'm in. So now that I've made this public video testimony that I'm getting a new coffin, I will do this. And that's how I make myself 
do these stretch goals because what are we assuming is that we are going to live forever, which of course is not true. So here's Wes when he had two even shoulders. He no longer has two even shoulders. This is a sign of my husband watching the oats be unloaded at harvest at 5.30. What you can't see is the rubber made container at his feet where I've just delivered to him his hot supper, which he really appreciates. But this to me is a picture of commitment to integrity, um, honesty, detail, making sure the shear pin doesn't go. And he's sitting there thinking about, I wonder how I'm going to pay those bills this year. I wonder how Ian's going to pay off a million dollars worth of land debt, if that was the number. But this is the sign of, of commitment. And so when we are talking about the sparking con conversations, I need you to be clear about what we're talking about. Succession is the transfer of labor in your business, management, and ownership. Succession planning is not estate planning. They're related. Estate planning is for when you pass. But the conversation started that happened again this morning with a multi-million dollar business family that's very complex in many different locations in Saskatchewan. The woman, the young successor who's a mother and married and highly, highly skilled and trained, she's begging her father, begging him, Dad, what is the plan? Right? And so when you leave tonight, if you haven't already, I want you to pick up my business card. Because at the back of my business card, what I've just done is I've made an action, I've made my business card into a handout. And what's on the back of it, and if you got your you got your phones ready, take a picture of this slide right now. This would be a good slide to take a picture of. This is all the different layers of complexity that you need to have conversations about. So first of all, you have to talk and listen and create solutions. And that's what you do when you have a meeting. I don't have my flip chart beside me tonight because this is not a workshop. This is a meet and greet seminar. But you need to go to Staples and get yourself a flip chart because once you put the notes on the flip chart, then again, you get out your phones, click, flip, click, flip. And everybody who's been at that meeting has the same information instantaneously at the same time. Then we have our lawyers and wills, and I'm sure there's lawyers in the room tonight. And if I had my clickers, I bet that a quarter of you do not even have a will. And that makes me really angry. Because who said the old die first? My sister was killed at age 23. All right? Then we have your lifestyle dollar, dollar plan. And for the, the culture that I work with, which is retired, or which is farmers, do farmers ever retire? Not really. Okay, they reinvent themselves. So I wouldn't even use the word retirement in front of a farmer because he or she would be very angry with me. So I changed the language, and again, it's another learning part for sparking a conversation. Choose your words with intention. And ask, I'm just curious. Then we have the banking loan credit. I saw somebody with a CIBC name tag. Thank you very much for coming. Insurance, accounting, and a business plan. Now do you know why people don't do anything? Because they don't know where to start, right? So what this is, is just a method. And Scotiabank used to give these out as binders, and then I converted it into this. And Jerry, you might want to do this for continuity or any of you in other businesses. So I have already given you on my business card all these tabs. And what you do is you make your tabs any color you want, and then you just start organizing your life. It's not that hard. But what is going to drive you to do that? Because I love you list, um, I'll give you the text where you can get this digitally, is also another tool for you to get organized. Can your wife or your husband get into your passwords? I keep my passwords all on lastpass.com, and my husband knows who has the master password. But this was started by my friend Vaggie Van Camp because she lost her husband at age 47 in an accident. So if you want this list... You can write this down in your paper, text the message later tonight or while you're listening to me, and um, the message is in all caps, because I L U, and this digital um, tool will come to you. If you really love someone, do you procrastinate? I can't hear you. If you really love someone, do you procrastinate? No. If you really love someone, you take action. 
And I'm a farm girl that wants you to grab the bull by the horns. The other thing that you don't do is, is keep people in what we call the neutral zone. Now, many of you who are wearing wedding rings as a sign of your commitment to your spouse, those of you who are women who have diamonds on your finger, the day you got that engagement ring, what happened? What happened when you got your engagement ring? You got commitment, you got excited, and then what was the next question that people um, asked you when they saw the ring? When, right? When. So there's a timeline involved. It's just, oh, someday I'll get married. And, some, and yes, of course, now, of course, with venues in Saskatoon being booked for three years, that may be the case. But um, the whole idea of the neutral zone is you want to get out of neutral, which is a high place of high anxiety and high stress. And this is what I call the pain of not knowing. So if you have your writing pad with you, I want you to write down what I would really like to know. A daughter-in-law wants to know that if her husband is killed in the business or because of the business or if something happens to her husband, that she is not going to get kicked away and be left destitute. Right? That's what daughter-in-laws typically want to know. Women typically want to know, is this family going to be still coming to our house for family gatherings after this whole transition thing is done? They don't really care about the net worth. I mean, yes, they want to be financially taken care of, but they really want to know, are we going to maintain family harmony when this is all said and done? So what needs to end is uncertainty, and what needs to begin is the clarity of expectations and the certainty of agreements. And if you're in the neutral zone, I call it the pain of not knowing. And I was listening to a podcast uh, by Susie Larson, who's my new favorite podcast. It's called Middays with Susie Larson. And she interviews authors from all over North America. And one author was talking about fear. And he said, the way to overcome fear is not to think about yourself or what you're afraid about, but to think of uh, be other directed. So for those of you who are planners and advisors, you might want to focus the conversation on how do you want to create a better life for your loved ones, i.e. your spouse, your siblings, um, the people of Saskatoon, whatever that looks like to you. And I thought the swimming example was very good because when this grandfather or father is holding up this little girl, he's supporting her from underneath, right? And he says, you can trust me. I'm not going to let you drown. Is a good father going to let his child drown? Absolutely not. So why are we letting our families drown in uncertainty and not knowing what the plan is? And here are some other fears. Loss of wealth. Many of you in this room are specialists at managing wealth and creating wealth. And Jerry just said, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. If you go on my blog, I actually have written about the great wealth transfer because I was at the National um, Institute of Financial Planners Convention last June, a year ago in Halifax, and speaking about the undiscussable. And it's just incredible the amount of wealth in Canada that needs to transfer over these next few years, which is why it's so important we have a plan. But do any of you like to fight? Except those of you, of course, who are Irish like me. No, just kidding. Okay. But the fighting is not necessarily bad, if it has resolution, and if it's resolved, and if it creates solution. And the other piece here is loss of identity and control. So I have a few fun things in my box. And one of the things I happen to have in my box is a Walmart banana. Not the one in the food aisle. It's in the decor aisle. Okay? So what happens in, um, in India is when they have pest control with monkeys that are wrecking the crops, is they build cages and they put bananas in the middle of the cage. And then the monkeys start grabbing at the banana, but they can't get it out because of the cage. And then Farmer John comes along and bops them in the head, and they drop the banana. So when I have this banana, I want you to think about what is it in terms of creating success, philanthropy, security for your farm or for your family business that you're not letting go of. The accident that my husband was involved in was life-threatening, airlifted to Winnipeg, 10 days in trauma care, concussion, 13 fractures. Lived in my living room for three months in a hospital bed. I shut down my practice for three months. That was the wake-up call for, well, I guess I'm going to let go of being in control. And I, it was also an interesting 
time for our son to show that he could be a main manager. So when you look at a banana, I want you to think about what is it you're afraid of of letting go of? But we're not going to let go of something unless we have something more exciting to move towards. So let's think about what is it that you want to move towards. And in my Hudson coaching training, our, our saying is, let go. I'm letting go of dusting. Anyone else in the room let go of dusting? Oh, yeah, long time ago, right, Arlene? Okay, dusting, let go of that. And what do you want to take on? What do you want to learn new things? And then, so you let go, you take on. And what do you want to hold on? And to me, what I want to hold on to the very, very most, as I told you earlier, is richness in relationships. So I'm going to work really hard to make quick repair. I'm not going to let a conflict get three years old or five years old. And you all know somebody in Saskatchewan who is not talking to their sister. You all know somebody, right? That's terrible. So here we are. We've got two bulls. These are Angus, by the way. They've got their heads butting together. Are these bulls fighting or are they playing? What do you think? It's not a trick question. They're what? Actually, they're playing. These are my friend Mandy's bulls in New Zealand, and they're just nuzzling. But you're looking at bulls. We're all looking at the same thing, but you can interpret it a different way, right? Just like my beach ball. Let's try this again. What color do you see from where you're sitting? Just yell it out. Okay, but you don't see orange because that's on my side. So one of the key concepts of being able to spark a healthy conversation is the ability. Are you ready, Dave? I'm going to throw this to you. Oh, <laughs> you played volleyball at Bethany, didn't you? Okay, we'll leave it over there. One of the key things in, in, in sparking a healthy conversation is do you have the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes or take their perspective? And I actually have an online tool for this called the Conflict Dynamic Profile. And I did it on the family. And the um, successor over here, sitting close to me, I went, hmm, your score is pretty low. He has a very limited ability to see things from another person's perspective. And that's totally impacting his ability to see what his sister needs and wants as they grow this empire business together. All right? So I told you I wanted to find out how old you are. So we'll do this. It would probably be dangerous for you to stand up. So I'd just like you to give me a little wave if you want to. You don't have to play if you don't want to. But this is an interesting exercise. Anyone in this room in their 20s, just give me a little wave. Oh, good. The 20-year-old's good. She already has two children, three and four. Good for her. This is her break, having a chair with no interruption. Okay, so in your 20s, it's about making it and having independence, which means you no longer should be living in your parents' basement. Okay? when you're 26. The next one is the 30s. How many of you are in your 30s? Okay, we got some 30-year-olds here. Great. So 30s is really important because these people here are actually having a nap. They're exhausted, right? They, they want, see, this knowing laughter, right? This knowing laughter. Because they, they were looking after small children possibly. They worked late. They got lots of balls in the air. Stuff's going on. And this is the decade where you want to master your success. So today in my meeting, I had a 31-year-old and a 36-year-old. Yes, you should take a picture of this slide. This slide is worth $3,000, just so you know. <laughs> no kidding, I paid $17,000 US 15 years ago for this course. So put that in today's dollars. Big investment, really worth it. So I'll share this with you for free. 40, so my 36-year-old today who's approaching 40, why is he conflicted? What conversation does he want to have? It's right here on the board. He wants to know, when do I get to have equity? When do I have that security of the equity? And when do I get recognized for my contribution and move from being an employee to a shareholder? Oh, and did I tell you he's also the son-in-law? Uh-huh. So that's a very awkward conversation because his father-in-law is the majority shareholder, of course, right? So this slide is very helpful to all of us to remember we are not 12 or 21 anymore, except for some of you in the room. And then when you get in your 50s, it's about quality of life. In your 60s, it's about starting over. And um, maybe you want to even have a new business. I have people who've milked cows for 30 years, and at 50 years, they age, they transfer the farm business to the successor, and then they go off and create a new business. 
And who said that was wrong, right? And who said you can't be 95 and still own stuff? Because unfortunately, I have a 95-year-old who owns $5 million worth of equity. And I went, guys, your dad is 95. We trust him. Well, you know, I'd be sending him to the foundation and to continuity for some really robust conversations because he doesn't need $5 million when he's 95 years old. Because in Manitoba, most people don't live past 114. <laughs> Just saying, okay? So, and then, and then you can, you know, and then 70, it's like they wrote your banner, um, Jen, because it says meaningful life, right? That's what your banner says, meaningful life. And in your 80s, about, you know, elderhood, blessing, and your 90s, please hand it all over by the time you're 90. Because it can be doing so many other great things, and I'm sure that your family loves you so much, they are not going to leave you on the street, right? And you can have those conversations. So, so here's another issue for sparking a conversation. What do you do when the parents don't agree? Oh, burn the house down. Well, no, I think you should say, blow it up. Yeah, blow it up. Because I'm sitting in a family meeting with three sons and the parents, and the mother was having a really hard time moving off the main yard. And the son said, I think we should just blow mom's house up. He actually said that in the meeting. Guess what mom did? And she's out the door, like never to be seen again. So as a planner, advisor, or as a person in your family dynamic and your family business, if you're finding that you're in that neutral zone and the gear's not getting in gear, I want you to start asking yourself, I wonder, I'm just wondering, is this, are my parents aligned? Because I have a case right now of a ranching family where that's not happening. Also, what you truly believe to be true. So there are some uh, values clouds floating around, but if you didn't get one, that's what they look like. And uh, we did this exercise today in our meeting to find out, I want honesty, I want wealth, I want intimacy, I want friendship, I want teamwork, no, I want independence. And so is different wrong? No, different is not wrong, it's just different. But what I need you to understand that what we believe to be true, our core values, how we behave to each other, and how we make decisions in our businesses, this is called culture. And culture is the glue that holds your family business together. And so you need to be clear about what your intentions are. So I have a mother-in-law, and when I'm in Saskatoon, you know what she does? She comes here, Mike, and she comes into my house, which of course used to be her house, and she puts baking in my freezer. Can you believe that? Really? Okay, let's back this up. Ah! You have to meet my mother-in-law, Margaret Frey. She's the most amazing woman. She can make cinnamon buns, flesh ski plots, and all that good stuff, and she puts it in my freezer. And when she comes up and I come home, I give her a big hug and I say, thanks, Mom. So what I just demonstrated for you is intent, action, effect. I have no idea right now what's going on in your head, what your intentions are. That's on the yellow side. All I can see is your actions or hear your words and kind of decode that. And then when I respond to you, I have no idea what effect it has. So at my family meeting with my mother, six weeks before she died on July 21st, 1998, I declared, I expect nothing from you, Mom, from your estate. And I was honest. Because I, Elaine Fraze, farmer from southwestern Manitoba, has always been wealthier than my parents. And therein lies the reality of 2019. You will have people in your circle, in your family, who are wealthier than your parents. And that's just the way it is. So we have just a few minutes to talk about what you're going to do to get this conversation done. And this is a bull. I had a bull collection. I've stopped collecting bulls because I hate dusting. Remember how I already told you that? So this is my talking stick. This is Beanie Baby Ox. If you see him, buy him, mail him to me, and I'll pay you. Because I only have two of them, and I'm sure I'm going to lose them someday. This thing got thrown around. Are you ready, Mike? I, I told you I wouldn't embarrass you, but you can catch this. There you go. So when Mike holds the bull, he gets to talk. And I say, Mike, are you ready? Are you done? That's, that's about it. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> that was a very short conversation. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. The reason it's soft is it can be thrown back and forth. And people say, Elaine, this is goofy. This is a toy. This is a powerful tool. The indigenous people call it a talking stick. They, this is my... Um, Moniker for discuss the undiscussable. So we're gonna we're gonna whiz through this. 
First of all, you have to decide that you don't like status quo. You have to take charge and you have to say, I heard Elaine speak. I have some questions that I need to know. It, the pain of not knowing is killing me. I want to create some certainty in my life. So you're going to take charge and you're going to actually set up the conversation. All right? You're also going to read the book called Instant Influence by Michael Pant, P-A-N-T, Alon. Because this is helpful, especially for you men who like really concrete things. So what I would ask you is that on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being really ready, how ready are you to get your will updated? 10. Okay, but what if you said two? If you said two, I'd say, why didn't you pick a lower number? So I have a farmer husband who's very procrastinating with a wife in a meeting in Stratford, Ontario, and their number for seeing a financial planner, her number was a 10, his number was a two. How big of a gap do we have here? We have an eight point gap, right? So it's a good way of helping you figure out the readiness factor when you're going to be like this bull and you're going to take charge and you're going to drive things and you're going to have meetings and you're going to make appointments with Jerry and get stuff done, that's great. But if nobody else is coming with you, you got a problem, right? So you need to figure out how ready everybody is. The next thing you need to do is come from a position or an intention of curiosity. So you can say, I'm just curious, what do you think about me having a pine handmade casket? Now, my husband knows about this. He eventually finds out everything. But sometimes other people will find out before he does. So he th he's, he's cool with that. And I'm actually going to put a quilt on it. And it's going to be a bookcase in my spare room. So nobody will know it's a casket. Because, of course, on a farm, it's not a good idea to store things outside, right? So that's, that's it. So when you come from curiosity, you're also taking a mindset of, what do I need to learn from this? So this is based on the work of Marilee Adams, who wrote another really great book called change your questions, change your life. And that's why you need to get to know James, because James is very skilled as a mediator of asking powerful questions. So when I get people who aren't happy, one of my questions that I'll say, okay, your father's not making plans, you've been in slave labor for 10 years, you don't like your family business anymore, here's my question, why are you still there? They don't like that question. That's a very powerful question. You think you don't have choices? We live in a wealthy country. You're all well-educated people. I think you can all read, speak, and have a great place to live. You have choices. So what are you responsible for? What assumptions you're making? And what are your choices? And this is my car when I made a bad choice. I backed out of my garage without looking. Left. Left is my lane, which is a half mile long. And there, unbeknownst to me, was a semi-truck coming full bore at me with barley. And it was my neighbor, Jason Hildebrand. He says he honked his horn. I heard nothing. He hit me, but I didn't die, obviously, because I'm here. I'm not a figment of your imagination. This is the real Elaine Vrace. Yes. But what I did do is make a lot of damage to my car because I made an assumption. I assumed nobody was coming down my lane. I live on a seed grower farm. I have semis on my yard all the time. So one of my audience members said, Elaine, I have an idea for you. Start putting your butt in first in the garage so you come out face first instead of rear end. I said, no, that's not going to happen because I have all my accidents backing up. That would not be a good idea. Another tool for you is to ask deeply. So here it is about asking better questions and being empathetic. But also on the um, handout table, you have my fairness postcard which is my YouTube video, which is an hour long. So this is a tool that you can go to together as spouses, and then you can take your kids and watch it together with your successors. And what it's going to talk about is what fairness looks like. And my moniker for fairness is, my definition is helping everyone be successful. And I used to collect smiley faces, so that's why those are there. Another, another thing that you're going to have to talk about is compensation for free labor and what sweat equity means in the conversation. You're also going to have to be able, okay to talk about feelings. Because the ability to express anger, anger is secondary, anger is either hurt, fear, or frustration. And if you don't understand that, it's based on the work of Dr. Dan Allender, who did a lot of work in the child abuse field. But if you're angry, I'm not going to hook into your anger. I'm going to say, Jess, you spent so much time planning this event. You did an amazing job. Why are you so angry? 
You know, you're not. Jess isn't angry. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm just making that up. Yeah, okay. She has beautiful earrings, too. Okay. So the, th the good question here that you can use is, I think it's time that we make some very important decisions. I feel really chaotic, confused, disappointed, frustrated, upset, however you're feeling. I need to create more certainty in my life, and I want us to do this together. So my dear loving husband spent three hours of perfect time when he could be going out doing crop protection with me in an office in Brandon, Manitoba, talking to a financial planner who told him he was going to marry somebody else. <laughs> but he was okay with that. And he goes, I don't really think this is... I said, Wes, we're going to do this. It's going to be great. And why we did it is because we did it five years earlier with a different planner and found out we had a million-dollar gap in our estate plan tax liability. We have a very, you know, interesting business that keeps growing because the price of land keeps going up. So we want to be 21% more profitable, so we're talking to each other. But as we're talking to each other, I am not pushing and shoving. I am waiting for him to say, yes, I'll come to that appointment with you, Elaine. We'll block off the time, and, and then we'll give some time for the decision to, to percolate, okay? Do any of you in this room like to be pushed and shoved? Not, not really, right? Especially if you're going to invest a lot of money in a certain direction for your business. Another thing I want you to do is not prejudge the outcome. I'm at the financial planning office a couple weeks ago with Wes, and all of a sudden it just blurts out of my mouth, I really would like to spend a month a year in Victoria. Really? Yes. My brother lives in Campbell River, my sister lives in Victoria, my best friend from grade 8 lives in Victoria, and about three of my speaker friends live out there, and a lot of my friends are moving there. I would really like to spend part of my life every year in Victoria, but only a month, because that would be a very long time to be away from my darling grandchildren, right? So grandma always has to come home eventually. But playing with possibility, well, how could we do that? Well, I have a couple in my um, church who go, used to go to Hawaii every winter for free for six months. How did they do that? They volunteered, absolutely. Right. So when you play with possibility, it's what makes coaching so exciting and a, a good advisor to have in your team because counseling is about recovery, about dealing with stuff that happened in the past. But coaching is about, there's a big world out there. There's lots of possibility. But do you expect or do you even think that there is possibility? And you can create possibility if you have your finances under control. So one of the, the F in the fairness acronym is financial transparency. Do you know your numbers? Do you know actually where you're at? And then the other piece for these t talking about tough issues is how are you creating trust? Have you made promises already to your successors or to your business partners that you've broken? I don't really want this to be on tape, but I'm, I'm kind of like a Brene Brown fan. I have a friend, and I won't say who he is, but a longtime person I've had a knowledge of who owes me $400,000 and is not paying. And we are people of integrity in our business, and to us, that's not, that's not a fair go. I have family members that owe, owe me money, and they're not paying. But I'm not going to push that because they're family members, right? And they're saying, oh, this woman is really bad with her accounts receivables. No. It's stuff goes sideways in business, right? We all know that. But what are you doing in the way you show up in your family and in your business decisions to create that respect, that sense of fitness, and, and, and let people know, I'm holding you accountable here. I'm not going to break my promises to you. The other thing about the fairness acronym is what is your attitude to money and what do you intend to have happen? Because I have no idea right now what you're thinking, other than you sent me two texts, and it's 1858, so let's answer them. How do you start the conversation, Elaine, when you wish to not give the business to your family? Okay. First of all, I think you should read the book Time, Eternity, and Possessions by Randy Alcorn, because that's his thesis. He doesn't think it is a good idea to leave your children each $5 million. So money can actually cause great harm. And our son is very clear that he doesn't want to be given a lot of things because he wants to earn stuff. So that's a good conversation. So starting that conversation is, first of all, knowing what you want to do, 
and why you want to do it that way. And so you would meet with your planner and you would, you would already have some very good understanding and language as to how you would have that conversation. I also would, would um, get an outside facilitator to help you with that conversation, and I would not do it at the family kitchen table. Because at the family kitchen table, what happens there? Familiarity. That You can't sit in that chair. That's my chair. I've been in that chair since I was five years old. Okay? So you really should go to a neutral zone, and today I, I met at 220 on 20th Street. I think I told you that already. A great place to meet. You can rent the boardroom. It's a neutral place. So I would start the conversation. And I would also ask or hope in this question is, are you aligned with your spouse in this decision not to give the business to your family? Um, and again, you're, you probably want to give the business to somebody who's really passionate about it. So here's another conversation starter. Where is it written? that I have to give my business to my family. And that's based on the work of Susan Forward, who wrote the book, really good book, Emotional Blackmail. Ooh. But when you use the word, where is it written? Where is it written to be a good farm wife? You have to have a massive garden. I said that in Saskatoon a year ago, and I had like nine people on Twitter, Elaine Fraze said I didn't have to have a garden, and it's the most wonderful thing in the world. It feels so good, right? So when we use the phrase, where is it written, you're challenging people's assumptions and expectations. I hope that's helpful. Another question, how, do you, how, how often, Elaine, do you see the older generation, i.e. 70 plus, that won't make decisions in a transfer? Is it as often as I think? Yes. And, and the reason, again, when you think of 70 year olds, um, and, and, and my sister-in-law is 70, and I'm eight years away, seven and a half years away from that. My curiosity is, what is it about transferring your wealth or transferring some of your assets? Because the other thing I think that that traditional generation has that keeps them stuck is all or nothing thinking. Are you familiar with the color black and white? And there's no gray ever? Like your dress, right? It's like it's either this way or it's this way. Well, no, folks, it's called a polarity. So a polarity is an affinity dance that we take between we plan and then we act. We plan and then we have to act. It's just like work and play. We work, but then we have to have some play to renew or else we're not going to be any, any good at work, right? So when you have people who are refusing to let go, you got to pull out the curiosity card and say, I'm just curious, what is it you're having a hard time with? And I know the person who asked me this question because you're in my phone. And uh, anyway, so you're working with a lot of wealthy people and you're trying to get them to transfer wealth. And I found a 70-year-old was afraid of transferring shares in his company because he was afraid that his daughter-in-law was just going to up and sell the whole thing because she liked nice things. The son had been working with the father in this business for over 20 some years. He would be horrified to know what his father was thinking. So I get them in the same room together and I say, Charlie, you're now 75. Would you please explain to your son who's been with you for 20 odd years why you're reluctant to give up this part of the business? I have to tell him, Elaine, yes you do because you told me. And if you don't, I will. No, I don't say it like that, but as a coach, you can understand the sacred space I'm in because I have everybody telling me exactly what they want. Well, don't tell me. Tell each other, right? And in conflict resolution, we call that a triangle. You want to flatten the triangle. So if I have a fight with Arlene, I'm not going to go tell Jerry that I'm fighting with Arlene. I'm going to go to Arlene and say, Arlene, we've got something going on here. Let's, let's make this better, right? But triangles are happening in families all the time. And you know what it's called? Family gossip. You would not believe what my sister did. You would not believe what mom said. You would not believe what... Stop it. And now my Irish is coming out and I'm getting hungry. So maybe I'm hangry. I don't know. No. So I hope that answers your question. But yes, the reticence of people to let go or transfer things is because somehow in their head, they think it has to be everything. And what I'm coaching you to do is what pieces would make sense first. We have just transferred our seed business, our seed cleaning and certified seed business, to Ian and Kendra. They're 30 years old and 28. Is that okay? Absolutely. 
because we're going to have preferred shares and we're going to have redemptions and we're going to have dividends and we're going to have income over a long period of time. And guess what? My tax specialist was sitting on my couch right beside my accountant. And we had a family meeting the same day we met with financial planner. That was a really big day. That was eight hours of talking about what our future was going to look like. Was it worth it? Absolutely. Do, do business people like to pay more tax than they need to? And did you know that there's tax changes, significant ones coming at the end of this year, I've been told. So some people are glad they've procrastinated, but procrastination is not always going to work in your favor, right? So my curiosity with the 70-year-old is to come back and say, wow, this is really hard for you. So you recognize, you empathize the pain of letting something go. In the book that I'm gifting to you tonight, there's a chapter that says, I'm moving in 2020. That is no longer true. Because my daughter-in-law came up to me and she said, Mom, we need to talk. Ooh, don't ever say that. That's not a good preface for having to start. Say, Mom, I'm just curious. Yes, Kendra. I'm wondering, you know that half mile you have, rule you have about us living a half mile apart? Would you be okay if I didn't live in your house? And I go, well, I thought that was the plan. We decided you'd move here in 2020. She said, well, actually, I don't like your house. Uh, the kitchen's too small. You have uh, mice in the basement, sometimes far too much water seeping up through the middle of your basement. And um, I think you should stay here. Really? So where are you going to live? Uh, I would like to build a new house just across the tree line. And so that's what they did. So even in what I wrote four years ago or whenever that book was published, that's changed, right? So again, here's my saying, that was then, this is now. And so we have to, we have to be the kind of people that can make a plan, execute it as, as best as possible, and then be okay when the, the plan goes a little bit sideways or that there's a change. So I'm up on time now. It's 7 o'clock. And uh, here we are at, at uh, attitudes, intent, and role expectations. And the last two are respecting boundaries and knowing that you are going to die. So I think this is a nice place to land because this is sponsored tonight by Continuity and by the Foundation. And I really want you to think about this. There is great joy in giving. And in, in Proverbs, it talks about generosity creating um, an opportunity for charity which alleviates poverty. And there's many people in our circle of influence that we meet that can be extremely wealthy people, but they're very poor in, in uh, relationship, right? It really doesn't matter to me what your net worth is. I want to know what your richness of your life is. And I have a very rich life because I am able to give, but I'm also able to receive and I'm also able to have conversations with people about what is the life they intentionally would like to create. But I really want you to grab that bull by the horns and take charge. Because it's your life, it's your business, and it's your family. And I really want to in, in, encourage you to make really good choices. So give with a warm hand and give while you're living. Thanks, and have a blessing on your journey.